Um, so this, this has, of course, great social consequences. It starts, for example, by the notion that society is to be built by people together. It's their common project. Society is the common project of the people. Society is what is called a res publica. It's, it's a common cause. It's a common enterprise. And the people are, and now comes this term, symbiotics. They live together, symbiotics, they live together. But they're also partners, they're co-workers. They cooperate, they work together in building this society. Um, before the English philosophers like Thomas Hobbes and John Locke saw society as a contract, Calvinist thinkers saw society as a covenant. So before the idea of a contract, which is a more limited concept, we had the notion of a covenant. They, they, they talked about covenanting with one another. And the covenanting people saw one another as partners in a common life. And this is remarkable, because the English contract th uh, thinkers, Thomas Hobbes in the first place, tended to see the human person, human individual, as an enemy of one another. So not a partner. Not a co-worker, but an enemy of one another. Eh? Striving even perhaps after someone's death. So when you are attacked, you're allowed to kill uh, the attacker. Eh? That's the, the interpretation of the, of the uh, natural right in the version of Thomas Hobbes. And um, so see here the, the big difference. Eh? Uh, people who are enemies of one another, they cannot trust one another, so they need contracts to bind one another by agreement, versus the idea of people who are co-workers, partners, that covenant with one another and build society together. So they trust one another. The notion of trust, of course, is here very important, that you trust one another in this common enterprise. One of uh, my heroes is uh, Thomas Althusius, uh, 17th century thinker, a Calvinist, who uh, wrote the Politica, and in this Politica he is explaining this all, right? how society is built, by people who work together, and they have their own spheres wherein they cooperate. And it, this means that when we work together as partners, that we never view the other as valueless, and uh, never uh, promote only our own interests at the cost of others. So we pr promote also the interests of other people. And he, he says even to the point that we willingly give up our own rights. So we work together even to the point that we willingly give up our own rights. So that's the, the, the absolute contrast with Thomas Hobbes. In Thomas Hobbes you cannot give up your own right and your own right is ultimately your right to kill someone else. And here, uh, Althusius, a very Christian, makes a very Christian statement to say, we cooperate, we, we also serve the interests of others, even to the point that we willingly give up our own right. And I think, yeah, this, these notions offer a strong underpinning of civil society, yeah, of civil society as a cooperation of, of civilians. Society is not built on private interests, but on common interests, not on individual power, but on cooperation. In this society, where you willingly give up your own interests, is also, let's say, the best society to care for the weak and, uh, and the vulnerable. It includes also people who have not the power, not the resources to offer anything to others. They are included in the covenant of society. Now I come to the third idea. Um, so when we serve God in our daily life, in this manner, as, as, as sketched in the, the last part, so if we serve God in our daily life, in cooperation, in labor, working together, in doing what we have to do, in serving the interests of everyone, when we do this in our daily life, this will help us to discern 
different social responsibilities and the value of different social contributions to society at large. Although so, uh, society is a common enterprise, it's also a differentiated network of responsibilities. So we run businesses, we educate children, we write laws, um, we care, and we cure. There are all different practices, all different responsibilities. And they are not footloose, and they, they are in, embedded in social structures. There is a practice of lawmaking in Parliament, there is a practice of keeping the law by judges and attorneys, etc. So there are, there are different, and there is an, a practice of, of uh, uh, doctors, of nurses, uh, of social workers. They have their own skills and they have their own goals. And, they have their own abilities that, that need to be trained. They have their own virtues within these practices. And the point that I want to make is that these virtues, these norms, these ideas, uh, these goals, they have a normative value. Uh, they reveal in a way something about God's creation order. They show which norms should be followed uh, when we try to pursue the goal of these different practices. So what does it mean to be a good businessman? What does it mean to be a good nurse? What does it mean to be a good teacher? And so these are not valueless. They are, these are all practices where virtues come to expression. And you must remind that virtues often come to expression, I think, uh, virtually always in social relationship. And so I can be righteous only with regard to others, in what I do. Uh, and I can be just, or I can be modest, or I can be uh, loving, a loving person, only in relationship to others. So it's, the, the virtues are always um, social virtues. So we practice them in relationships. We practice them when we work, when we do our day or things. And Okay, so we have different practices, we have different responsibilities, and this, um, this idea of a differentiated social life um, was grasped by Abram Kuyper right, in this book um, uh, in the notion of sphere sovereignty. He was saying that you have different spheres in society, the education, school, uh, business, economy, science, university, um, well, transport system perhaps, or whatever, nursery. So you have different spheres with their own set of rules and norms and authorities, responsibilities. And they, are, they have some, they, they, they are to be respected uh, as a as sphere on, on its own. They have a certain autonomy. They are not, they're not totally autonomous because God is sovereign, so they have to be responsible to God, as all powers have been. All responsibilities, uh, it's the same for all powers, all responsibilities are functioning under the so sovereignty of God. But at the same time, they have their own field, their own area, their own authority. So, um, the businessman can order his uh, employers. <coughs> Uh, employees, but he cannot order, he cannot uh, direct the bus driver. Right? Or a, a teacher can say to students, you have to do this assignment tomorrow. But he cannot go out and say to, let's say, Fuzhinik, you have now to train your, football, your soccer players in such and such a way. Right? So then Fuzhinik would say, okay, go home to your classroom, that's your place, my place is here at the hitting field. Yeah? <laughs> so th there are different spheres and different authorities and you cannot mix them up. I think it's a very important idea. It's one of the, the most central, most uh, fine ideas I think of Calvinism. It's all already there in Althusius. It's not only Abraham's finding, but it's already there in, in Althusius. Uh, that we have different spheres, the family, the school, the church, the business, Etc. And you cannot relate them. You can you, you can relate them to one another, 
that the authority in one sphere is not the authority in another other sphere. I think that's an important idea. Um, well, there are worldviews, life systems, that say, well, there's one authority. It's the Pope or so, huh? or he's a spiritual leader, and he can say everything uh, about you, what you have to do. How many children you have to have in your family, or whatever. Um, but that's not the point here. Here's the point that there are several responsibilities, authorities, and they have to be respected in themselves. And here's also the notion of equality, uh, again. Um, and I think it's perhaps for you interesting to think this over because of this hierarchy, this idea of hierarchy also in, in, in Asian thought. Because all these social structures, they have their own sphere, but they are equal to one another. And they have to be equal right, because of what I said, that the teacher cannot direct the bus driver, or the elder in church cannot direct the businessman in doing his business. Every authority belongs to its own sphere, and they're in principle, they're equal to one another. So they're equal, and they are value-loaded, they have normative principles to be followed, there are certain virtues in all these practices, and you have to discern them, you have to discover them. I think it's an it's a important task for a student, for you, to discover the normative principles in every sphere. So we made a sort of inventorization of the fields you're active in, and it's different here. Uh, but you have to find out what are the normative principles in my area, in economics. And it's not only business ethics, it's also how does the economy function? What is right? What is wrong? Uh, how do I do justice to the economic reality in a Christian way? What kind of norms do I then have to find? How do I do justice to the autonomy of the, of the family? Um, how do I respect uh, what's going on within families? What are the normative principles? How can we uh, give an advice to educators? What do, they have, what do they have to do? So, this is a very fruitful idea, I think. A very fruitful idea for Christians to think deeper about all these practices. Well, many people in, in our culture, in our world, think, well, it's neutral, it's techniques. Huh? You, can, you can apply a set of, of rules or you can, it's ju just neutral. I heard that uh, at Seoul in, in this conference that people were saying here in Korea you had a situation that under Japanese control till 1945 the church was growing under the Japanese oppression, but the church made a, a strong split between itself and society, between itself and the state. So the split between the separation between state and church in Korea, therefore, has been strong. And the state is not a world. The economy was another world. So you get a sort of dualism. Right? There's the spiritual sphere, uh, faith, and, uh, and the growing church, happily. Um, but a great distance to the sphere of politics and economics. Well, it's not only due, I think, to the Japanese colonization, uh, because we also, we also experience this in, in other situations. And it, it's a result of modernism, in a way, to say that there are fields that are neutral. Uh, the politics does not need uh, faith. <laughs> And, and in economics, you cannot apply your Christian morals. Well, they, they think it's all neutral. It's just the thing that you can do. But I don't believe it. Everything is loaded with normative principles, with virtues to be exercised, to be expressed. And you have to find them. You have to apply them. And they are, they are woven in the texture of all these practices, all these, prof all these professions. So be aware of that, and uh, yes, and, and of course we live now in this world of, uh, 
of all kinds of new developments. I mentioned it when I am here in Korea, I see the latest modern things around me. At the same time, uh, Korea, I think, is, is at this moment is trying to become more and more interwoven with a, a globalized world. Right? In a way, Korea is, is my impression, so forgive me when I'm wrong, but is, is also a bit isolated. It, it has had its own development, strongly concentrated on itself, and of course to develop a lot of things in your own country that had to be developed. Uh, all these new bridges and railways and cities and skyscrapers and you have, you have them all now. Uh, but I think perhaps now you get into the phase that you look around you and look to the globalizing world. Which also means all kinds of influence from outside coming in. Uh, unless your government is closing the cultural borders, I don't know if they do this, there are many means to keep the world out. But um, be, becoming more a part of the globalizing world also means, of course, that, that uh, economic powers come in, technological uh, powers come in, new ideas come in, postmodern ideas come into your country, and you, you have to relate to them. So you have to think about your own life system again. Well, we experience this in the Netherlands quite strongly. And we say we are an open society, we are an open economy, and we are part of the European Union. So the European Union is more and more becoming our government, uh, and, and uh, integrating us as, a, as an independent country in, in an internal, internal market of the European Union. And we discover that we cannot decide on all matters on our own anymore. And at the same time, we have all kinds of influences in our country. So we become pluralistic. We have the Islam. You don't have the Islam in that way as we have, have it. In my own street, when I look out my window, there is a Muslim school across the street. And I see all the Muslim children. At Saturday and Sunday, they go to school. And I ask one of those boys at the street, what are you going to do? And he said, Mos mosque, he said. And what he meant is they're going to learn Arabic at Saturday and Sunday. So they go to school from Monday to Friday. They learn uh, their lessons, uh, language, etc., uh, geography, everything, history. And on Saturday and Sunday, they go to school and they learn Arabic. And they have their own society within the Dutch society. They have their own culture. So we have all kinds of currents of thought and religion and atheism and everything, we, we have it in, in our spiritual market. And for, for us it's important as Christians to know where you, where you stand there, what, what your perspective is. And I think it's for you also important to build up strongly an, own, an approach of your own. That is Christian worldview, life system, so that you have an answer. And there are many challenges around it, but that you, that you, that you have an answer. It's also for Christian young people. I talk a lot to Christian students in the Netherlands. So I have these classrooms also in the Netherlands. <coughs> I talk a lot to them. and um, They have many questions. How to live in such a, such a world. And it's so important to have an orientation. To have, a, to have an idea, a yardstick, a goal. So that's one thing. And the, the other thing is uh, individualization. I think uh, this will also come in a way in this Korean society. Uh, we have it in the Netherlands uh, strongly. Right? That people say, well, I have my own uh, norm system and I don't need any authority. Well, you have this idea of f strong f family, uh, f family authorities. I think this is here much stronger than in you. And you, you have a deep respect for parents and grandparents, well, I think this comes somehow from what is it, Buddhism or Confucianism, the strong family respect here, to respect the authorities, that the elder people always go before you, and you always listen to, uh, to the generation above you. Well, you haven't had the French Revolution here. We have in Europe. And the French Revolution meant, well, throw off all authority. Huh? Throw it off. 
what is an authority that they can say to you what you have to do? So, well, and that was devastating in a way. It was perhaps, for, in a sense, it was also good because it liberated people. But in another way, it was devastating. Because now you have so many people that say, who's my authority? I am my own authority. Not my parents, not my grandparents, not the pastor. No one. So, perhaps here it's different. I think this idea of family authority will remain strong here. It's, it's, you cannot wash this away. At the same time, I think you have to, to think about this. In the light of what I said, that all powers are limited. Even the powers of parents are limited. They are, they are given, it is a given authority. So you have to think, to think this over in your own culture. But I think that individualization will also come here. When I uh, walk around at the university here, everyone is doing what I am doing now. <laughs> this. They are walking so this way. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I don't have eye contact. <laughs> in the subway, in Seoul, it is the same. Uh, everyone is doing just this. So there is no conversation, there is no communication. Who will you not forget to take a picture of the class? Yeah, I will take a picture of the class. I have many, many pictures. Uh, uh, Later. <laughs> so, so but this, this is in a way, it's a symbol of individualization. No? We have all our own, own sphere. And um, so it will do, perhaps do something also here. I don't know what, but it's, the, 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 these are the challenges. Globalization, which takes us from where we are, embedded as we are in social structures, to a world level. Eh? Thomas Friedman, the, the American journalist, was saying the world is flat, right? so you can communicate with everyone where we want. So I can call now my wife in the Netherlands, and you can call someone perhaps in, uh, let's say, Africa, if you want to. So if you want, we can call all over the world. So the world is flat. In a fast way, we can communicate with whoever we want. So that's the globalization, and then you have this individualization, which can also mean we are so concentrated on our own subjectivity, yeah? our own self, our own self that is unrelated in the long run. It is unrelated. It is no, no longer relationship with others and also not perhaps with God. So th th this idea of alienation, of being alone, I think is one of the curses of this modern society. People cannot relate anymore. They lose the ability to relate. Which is, of course, uh, not a, a nice uh, perspective. Okay. To conclude. When Abram Kuyper toured through America with these lectures in 1898, he feared a clash of civilizations between Asia and the rest of the world. 